May 27th, 1976. It's game two of the NBA Finals featuring the 42 and 40 Phoenix Suns on the road against the 54 and 28 Boston Celtics. Phoenix, in a seven game engagement, usurped the Colossus that was the Golden State Warriors in the Western Conference Finals beating the championship favorites, essentially a 60-win team that season. The forerunners of today's Valley Boys were confident they could defeat the Boston Celtics. I mean, Phoenix had a future Hall of Famer as their lead horse in Paul Westphal, and their number two option was rookie sensation Alvin Adams, averaging 20 a night, taking home Rookie of the Year honors and being one of the rare 45 individuals to ever make the All-Star team as a rookie. The team featured plenty of notable names beyond the aforementioned. They made it to the NBA Finals, everyone had to have played their part. Even a 30 year old shooting guard from Schenectady, New York. Pat Riley was a journeyman for his career, winning a championship alongside Jerry West in 1972. He'd have a spectacular performance in his last game of professional basketball on May 27, 1976 playing on the floor for a singular minute and in those 60 seconds contributing a perfect donut across the board. Phoenix lost in the 76 finals to the Celtics because they had their five future Hall of Famers, yet the greatest champion to play in that series did so for the losing side, contributing absolutely nothing in his play. It was not Paul Westphal or the five Hall of Famers on the Celtics. No one would know it at that moment. But certainly, May 27th, 1976 was the day The Godfather was born. Riley would spend the next two years as a local broadcaster for the Lakers. In 1976, Pat Riley would join the Los Angeles Lakers as an assistant coach under interim head coach Paul Westhead. Paul West had revolutionized basketball offenses by polishing the running style offense he inherited from his predecessor, Jack McKinney. Riley would spend two years harnessing his knowledge of coaching while his team won an NBA championship. His time would arrive in short notice as tension between Westhead and superstar Magic Johnson grew volcanic with Johnson detesting Westhead's offensive philosophy. Barely at the start of the 1981-82 season, Westhead was kicked to the curb and Riley was given the reins to the team. When he got the keys to the car, that's when Showtime really became a household name. In the heart of Hollywood, the flashy jerseys in purple and gold were symbiotic with their wearers. I mean, any team with Magic Johnson as its face will be glamorized by default. They had a young head coach who was walking up and down the floor wearing thousand dollar Armani suits and custom tailored dress shirts from Saville Row. Was he there to coach the basketball team or watch them from the VIP lounge? Riley looked more like an investment banker than a basketball coach and his wardrobe became a point of notice making him one of the first NBA celebrities who wasn't playing in the game. Although LA faced afflictions losing in a couple finals, Riley's time as the head coach for the Lakers were his days of thunder, amassing four NBA championships, a coach of the year award, and winning back to back in 87 and 88. Showtime demonstrated to the masses that basketball could be entertaining and exhilarating beyond the athletics on display. And that era is one of the most fascinating in NBA history. I mean, they should really make a TV show on it. Fame can grab a hold of you, but it can manifest itself into a real personality change. I thought I was the reason that we are successful. The ego gets a little inflated. When we lost in the playoffs, I could feel the wolves closing in. Following a second round defeat at the hands of the Phoenix Suns, the Los Angeles Lakers announced their decision to part with Riley as their head coach. Riley would spend a year away from coaching, returning to TV as a studio analyst for NBC. He would begin his new tenure as the head coach of the New York Knicks in 1991-92. The Knicks finished with an impressive record of 51 wins to 31 losses. They'd notably lose in Game 7 of the Eastern Conference Semifinals to the Michael Jordan-led Chicago Bulls, an exemplary feat for the Knicks regardless of the outcome. In 93, Riley led the Knicks to the number one seed in the East with a 60 and 22 record, tying their greatest regular season record. The Garden was rocking that year, ranking top five in attendance, and the Knicks were the number four preseason favorites to win the NBA championship. And the playoffs did nothing but intensify the fire that burned on the Garden's hardwood. 
The Knicks cruised through the first two rounds of the playoffs, losing a game apiece in each. And for the third year in a row, they matched up against the Bulls, who appeared more celestial than ordinary at that point, having not lost a single postseason game. And let any New Yorker tell you, after those first two wins in the Garden, 93 looked like the year. But as history has shown, it's never your year if you're playing against the Ghost in Chicago. After taking a 2-0 lead in the series, the New York Knicks proceeded to drop the next four games, losing the series 4-2. In 94, the regular season was another jaunt. However, the Knicks were presented with a golden opportunity. With Michael Jordan stepping away from basketball, the gates of glory swung open for any prospecting takers. And the Knicks spearheaded through those gates after an arduous seven game series against the Pacers. A series so gritty, out of both teams, the 100 point barrier was crossed once across all seven games. And when the Knicks reached the finals, they were matched up against the Houston Rockets and superstar center Hakeem Olajuwon. Hakeem Olajuwon versus Patrick Ewing would be a matchup of the century, two of the greatest centers to ever play the game, neck and neck on the grandest stage of them all. And this fight went the distance. In Game 7, Houston dragged themselves across the finish line because John Starks wanted to shit the uh, no, no, John Starks does not take complete ownership of New York's failure. Yeah, he had a terrible Game 7, a rancid performance. Maybe the worst choke ever. And yeah, he was also terrible for the series. Uh, maybe he was to blame, but he wasn't the franchise guy. Patrick Ewing was the legendary big man in a razor's edge matchup that could have gone either way, decided to average 18 points per game on 36% shooting from the field. I kid you not, this is one of the most severe drop-offs in NBA history and it's so eloquently glossed over because of John Stark's infamous Game 7. Ewing averaged 24 on 50% that year, Elijah won averaged 27 on 50% in the finals. Elijah Wan maximized his presence while Ewing shriveled under the lights. A legacy staining moment. You want to talk about old school hard knocks basketball? The Pat Riley New York Knicks personified that like no other team ever has to a fault at times. And 95 meant no end to the suffering as the Knicks dominated in the regular season yet again, but in a rematch against the Pacers, the conclusion was altered in the Pacers' benefit with them coming out victorious in 7. The constant heartbreaks broke Pat Riley and it sent him spiraling, so in his lowest moment, he dodged out of town leaving a wounded city gutted. The Miami Saga and Riley's triumphant ballad, the destination that will be boldly engraved on his legacy, did not start with a happy beginning. Pat Riley's trail to South Beach left a city full of hyenas who sought blood for betrayal. Riley admitted as such, the Knicks was a fiasco, it was my fault. The Knicks fans had every right to despise this man. He sent his resignation letter via a fax and there was obvious tampering from Miami's side which is why they were forced to compensate the Knicks with the first round pick and one million in cash. But as most fallouts tend to be, the blame game needs multiple participants. Knicks president at the time, Dave Checkets, is the paramount reason for Riley's unanticipated departure. Let's not bore on the details, basically Miami offered the Knicks head coach way more money under the table and more than that they offered him power. A level of authority Chekets was not willing to surrender. So what ensued in the words of Chekets was a war of he said he said which snapped the tether. And as a result, the Pat Riley era began in Miami. It didn't take long for him to cement himself as the patron savior of South Beach. He'd win his third coach of the year in 97. In his first six years as the head coach of the Miami Heat, he had a record of 293 wins to 167 losses, averaging nearly 50 wins a year. Miami would finally taste immortality in 05-06 with their franchise cornerstone Dwayne Wade leading the way. Riley would claim his fifth championship as a head coach. Two years removed from a championship, the Miami Heat would conclude the 2007-2008 season with an abhorrent 15-67 record, 
The humiliation Riley suffered would force him to abdicate his title of head coach. Becoming Miami's team president, he would wisely select Eric Spolstra as his successor, a man who'd go on to carve out a Hall of Fame career as Miami's play caller. Pat wasted no time in building Miami into a powerhouse. He plotted and schemed his way into pairing up his superstar Dwayne Wade with future Hall of Famers Chris Bosh and LeBron James. The Miami Heatles would go on to win two NBA championships and appear in four NBA Finals, one of the greatest teams ever assembled, and they'd give Riley his 6th and 7th NBA championships as a lead man, 9 championships in total if you include the two he won with the Lakers in 72 as a player and in 1980 as an assistant. Since then, his teams have made it to two more NBA Finals, falling short in both occasions, although them reaching the finals in the first place was a testament to Riley's team building since Miami was led by Jimmy Butler and a ragtag group of late rounders and undrafted guys. Pat Riley is the godfather for a reason. His presence can bend the air in the room as many of his players have reported. The respect he commands was earned because of his desire to satiate his winning appetite. Despite the numerous setbacks he's faced on the court and the constant restarts he's endured, the man has either reached the finals or claimed the Larry O'Brien in every one of his tenures. The Godfather is a man who wants to win above all else, and his spirit has seeped into every crack and corner of the Miami Heat organization. A team in the heart of Vice City is revered by the NBA world for their dedication, intensity, and attitude. That reverence was hand-built by Pat Riley, and only time will tell if the Godfather can claim his coveted 10th NBA championship. Thanks for watching.